Hello again, Chatsworth Lake Community Church, Lake Manor Chapel, Pastor Dale coming to you on a Sunday, and a happy Mother's Day to all to whom that applies. I'm going to pick up where I left off last week with our scripture study, which is from 2 Timothy chapter 4, just a couple of verses 6, 7, and 8. Paul says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. And finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. Not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. When will that day be? That's the day I think we should all be looking forward to, and with great anticipation. If we have put our faith in Jesus Christ, we're told that one day we will see him face to face and uh, everything will be new, everything will change. Right now, things can be a little stressful. So I'm looking forward to that day. Let's see when that day is going to come. When will Jesus come to receive us to himself as he said he would? And uh, believers will receive that crown that Paul speaks of, awarded to us by Jesus himself in person. Very exciting. Not to be confused with the second coming of Christ, which takes place at the end of the seven-year tribulation period. That day that Paul is referring to is a different day entirely. It's called the rapture of the church, which I believe by a preponderance of scriptural evidence will occur before the tribulation. Before the four horsemen of the apocalypse ride forth, and the rider on the white horse is the Antichrist himself who will consolidate the globalization of governments, finances, and world religions. Here's that description of him from Revelation chapter 6 and verse 2. And I looked and behold a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer. I say this because the secular globalization movement is now very much in full swing. And it is taking complete advantage of all the fear generated by this coronavirus pandemic. It's going to try to convince the world that the answer to all of our problems lies in finding a single world leader who can bring us all together. Because after all, we're all in this together. You're going to hear a lot of that kind of talk in the days to come. And a lot of it is going to be generated by fear, deliberate fear that the government is sending our way so that we will comply and we will obey. And whatever they do, we're going to learn to live with it. Here's one overreaching example of some of the group think that is taking place out there these days. It comes to us from San Antonio, Texas. Their city council just in the last day or so passed a resolution declaring that the term Chinese virus is now considered hate speech and is anti-Asian bigotry. And the city of San Antonio, in their wisdom, is asking its citizens to report any such anti-Semitic, discriminatory, or racist incidents to the proper authorities for investigation. In other words, we're to turn other people in for hate speech. The stage is being set for that rider on the white horse, and this is just the beginning. The four horsemen haven't even mounted up yet. But before, they're, before they do, there's coming, as Paul says, that day, quote unquote, that day. That is the day when born again believers, alive and dead, will be snatched up or caught away, an event separate and distinct from the second coming, not only in its timing, but in how it unfolds. At the rapture, the church goes up to meet Jesus in the air. This from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Now, how
how comforting would these words be if they weren't to take place until after the church has gone through the Great Tribulation. At the second coming, Jesus returns to the earth, comes all the way down. Zechariah 14 verse 4 says this, And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which by the way is the exact place from which he ascended in Acts chapter 1, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half the mountain shall move toward the north, and half of it toward the south. At the rapture, Jesus comes for his church. At the second coming, he comes back with his church. So don't confuse those two. And Jesus himself also spoke of that day. And uh, here are these words from John 6, verses 39 and 40. He said, This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son, that's Jesus, and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. I believe in this passage he is referring to the church. The church as a whole raise it up at the last day, verse 39, and the church as individuals raise him up at the last day, verse 40. He's indicating there's coming a rapture of the church when all people in Christ, alive and dead, will be raised up to meet him in the clouds. That will be the last day of the church, the last day of the church age. It is a finite age that began on Pentecost and ends with the rapture. Now the bridegroom has come for his bride, the body of Christ is joined to the head, and the church no longer exists as a separate entity, it is now one with Jesus. That's why the last day is referred to here. So we have the bridegroom coming for his bride. We have the wedding that begins. And then, of course, following the wedding, there was always a marriage supper. Matthew 26, 26 to 30 says this. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, now listen to this, I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. I believe he's referring to the marriage supper of the Lamb, described in Revelation 19, thusly. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19. 7 to 9, and it takes place before the end of the tribulation, before the second coming. Now, I think if we examine some ancient Hebrew marriage customs, we can better understand how Bible prophecies indicate where the church will be and what believers will be doing during the seven-year tribulation. Here's a description of a typical ancient Hebrew wedding, and I want you to see it's a beautiful picture of what Paul calls the mystery. Christ and the church. Following the betrothal of the bride, that's the church, to the bridegroom, that's Jesus, the bride knew she would be taken care of where she was going to live, and she was expected to get rid of undesirable and non-useful things before then. While the bride tended to her items, the bridegroom went back to build a home for them on the family property. Remember, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. That home could be anything from an extra room in my father's house, or many rooms, he said, or annex on the side of the house of his father's home, or it could be a completely separate house next to the house of his father on the family land. The groom and bride would not be expected to meet again until the father of the groom pronounced the construction acceptable for habitation. Only then was the wedding date set, and the man would then be given permission by his father 
to go collect the bride for the wedding. If the bridegroom was asked when the wedding was to be, he would have said, it is not for me to know, only my father knows, because his father was the one in charge of the final inspection of the groom's home. That's why Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour. During this time, the bride was to watch and wait at the home of her parents. That's what we're doing now. She would be considered set apart, now the word is sanctified, or known to be bought with a price, as we have been. She and her attendants had to maintain a constant state of preparedness, since the wedding date would not be revealed to her until the bridegroom actually appeared at her door to take her away to their new home, known as stealing her away. Again, a picture of the rapture of the church. While the bride kept ready, she would receive special gifts from the groom. These gifts were prepared by the groom or with the assistance of the father of the groom to prepare the bride for her marriage. The church is in process now being prepared for the, that day. When the bridegroom's father deemed the construction ready, the father would tell the bridegroom that all was completed to his specifications and that his son could retrieve his bride. For his part, the groom would try to show up unexpectedly to surprise the bride, carrying her off suddenly like a thief in the night when no one would see them. The bride would have to have her lamp and her belongings ready at all times. Her sisters or bridesmaids would also be waiting, keeping their lamps trimmed in anticipation of the late night festivities. The only momentary advance warning the bride would get was the blast of a shofar, the ram's horn, blown by the groom or his groomsmen, and the sound of the groom's voice shouting her name. This is right out of 1 uh, Thessalonians chapter 4, isn't it? The bride, who should have been keeping herself in a state of readiness for this day, would hear this and quickly get herself ready to be caught up in the commotion and taken to the wedding. The bride and her bridesmaids would then be taken by the groom and his groomsmen to his father's property. Once the people had gathered at the property of the father, a banquet would begin that would be at least a seven-day celebration. Coincidentally, the same period as Daniel's 70th week, a week of years, seven years. Eventually, the bride and bridegroom would emerge from the wedding chamber, reappear at the banquet, and receive the congratulations of friends and family. This is when a great feast would be held in their honor. The great feast is called the Marriage Supper. After the Marriage Supper, the bride and bridegroom would leave the groom's father's portion of the house. They would go to their own section of their home, or the separate house constructed on the family property. This was the home that the bridegroom had prepared for his bride, her new home, where they would live. And again, Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Let's remember as we wait that this world is not our home, that our citizenship is in heaven, that we are strangers and pilgrims on the earth, we are ambassadors for Christ, and we desire a better country, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called our God, for he has prepared a place for us. On that day, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. And it says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. Until next week, comfort one another.